everything is relative to the reader. So if their baseline is here and I took them all the way down here and then took them all the way up here, then their emotional distance mm -hmm. between the bottom and the top feels to them massive as opposed to if I just had something, you know, kind of bad happen and then something kind of good happen. And, and even if I do have something kind of bad happen and something really good happen, that is still less of a distance, an emotional distance than if I had taken them even lower. It's the reason why, you know, especially in the genres that we play in, death, loss, sacrifice, these things are so important. Releasing your inner dragon. So, Drake, if you were to end the story, how would you do that? Very well. <laughs> <laughs> um, at least that's my hope. So that's like literally that's the whole the whole topic. Um, that's that's a rough question to start off with. How about <laughs> this? How about we start off with defining what we're going to talk about in this podcast? Because I think, you know, you could say, oh, you're going to talk about the climax or, you know, we had the episode not too long ago about the falling action, the, you know, the return at the end of it. So let me ask you a question that's a little more confined, which is what are we talking about today? Like, what, what do you consider the ending topic to be that we're going to discuss? So for me, the ending topic is the resolution of your plot, your characters, and your theme. It's the actual, it's the climax, it's the falling action, it's the, the cementation of your character's growth arcs. It's that whole sequence of events that falls into that. Um, yeah, it's everything, it's everything the reader walks away with. It's, yes. it's that moment that the reader feels satisfied by the journey they just took. You know, I say this all the time. There's nothing real in a story. Your characters aren't real. Your world isn't real. Your conflict isn't real. The only thing that's real is the reader. So it doesn't matter if the character feels like they accomplished something because they're not real and they didn't accomplish anything. It only matters what the reader has gained by this journey. And so I see the ending as that. I see the ending as the culmination of have we tied everything up in this really nice way that allows the reader to feel fulfilled from the journey they just took. That's everything from, you know, like you said, it's everything from the character's journey. Does, do they feel the character's stories are complete? They're both their external and internal stories, but also that thematic element. You know, the reason for the story. Do they feel like they have learned something, gained something, you know, been forced to contemplate something that they can relate to their own lives? Because that's what stories are about. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing that people have lost today. So many stories today are being told on the superficial level, the physical layer that I call it. And those are fine. But you can only have so many Transformers. You know, we... That's that's not what stories as a whole are supposed to do. You know, I've said this before, uh, although this is kind of a recent addition to my nomenclature. A healthy society needs healthy stories. And so that's what we need here. We need we need to understand that storytellers are the thing that helps societies want to be better. And when we have these superficial stories that have no substance to them, it's just blowing stuff up and and that's it. I, I don't think that the occasional one of those is great. The occasional one of those is, yeah, let's go watch Transformers and watch a bunch of stuff blow up. It's going to be fun. It's like getting on a roller coaster. It's fun. But it's it's not impactful. You don't you don't think a year from now. Oh man, that roller coaster ride that I took at Six Flags, it really has impacted my life so much that I'm still thinking about it to this day. No, it was just fun in the moment. And that's all these stories. And that's where I feel like Hollywood is really messing up because everything has now become these little roller coaster rides. 
and there's no substance to them. So I'm going to, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. I think that one of the largest problems is that there are very few people amping for a specific piece of content to be made, right? There are very few people like, why was Dune, why was Vilniev's Dune so good? Because Vilniev wanted to make the movie. He pushed for it to be made. Yeah. And and because there is so much content being churned out these days by the studio, there's nobody driving for a like why was Blue Eyed Samurai so good? Because the writers had been working on it for ages and they went to the studio and sold the script but it is those projects are rare and the majority of projects now is the studio going we think this will get people to click on it make that yeah. and there's no writer heart behind the project right. so you're saying you're i think what you're saying is it might be a bad idea for a comic book franchise to hire somebody who's never read comic books and who thinks comic books are stupid to write and direct <laughs> comic book movies is that what you're saying I that sounds crazy that, to me that sounds I, I crazy think, I, think, I think that is a good I, I think i think you're wrong i think yeah. somebody who hates comic books is going to be the best comic book writer <laughs> like why wouldn't they be yeah. yeah it's it boggles my mind <laughs> why they've gone down and like Oh, we're gonna write a comic book movie. Who really hates comic book movies? Let's get them. But, but it's not like it's not just um, an individual project or anything. Like this is, I, I know that it's fun to kind of pick on the individual projects, but it's not an individual right. project. It's, there is a systemic problem in how Hollywood and 100%. the big studios are approaching content creation. Yeah, and part no of that longer... is adaptation to streaming, which they just have not done. Yeah, they're no longer having creators come to them with passion yes. and going please let me do this mm. they're actually going out and going okay i want a movie that has big reptiles in it yeah somebody who, who wants to make this for me yeah um, and that's the problem like because they're now pushing this money out in order to generate all this content it, it just it's empty yeah because it's just it's it's like paying a ghostwriter to write your story sure yeah. The words might come onto the paper and the prose might be pretty enough, but there's no heart. A great example in real time is Stranger Things. So they came to Netflix and they were like, please, please, please. And Netflix was like, fine. And it just blew up and everyone loved it. And then they finished season three and they were like, that's it. We're done. We're not doing another one. And Netflix was like, no, no, you're going to do one. We're going to force you to do one. And so they did. And season four feels like a season written by people who just didn't want to do a season four. Like they literally said, we don't want to do a season four. No, so heart. it's the, the, the creator has to be in it. I, you know, it's, it's really funny. So um, this is off our topic, but on to this topic that we're on here. So I'm writing my first Harn world story. So I was hired as the official writer for Harn world. I love Harn world. I'm excited about Harn world. Um, but it has taken me longer to get into this story. I mean, I spent about three weeks working on the first three chapters because the first time I wrote them and they were well written, but they didn't have any soul in them. I didn't like I would I would let some beta readers read it and they'd be like, oh, this is great. You know, this is this is really well written. But then I'd let some of my inner circle read it and they're like, yeah, it's well written, but it's not you. There's no you in here. I don't mm. feel your storytelling. And so it took me a while to really kind of get into this world that isn't mine. You know, it's not my world. It's a world that has been created. It's a world that exists out there, you know, for the last 40 years. And so it was harder for me to get into that than it is for me to just drop into something that I'm creating. Um, not that I'm not passionate about this Harnwell stuff. I love it. I, I am really excited about it. And the story that they gave me for the first story to write is one of the most impactful moments of the history of the world. 
and I'm so I'm totally excited yeah. about it, but it's not my world. And but so it's, it's not your world and it's not your story, right? You right. haven't built every layer of it. You haven't embedded the themes you want to play with. You have to play with other people's toys. Right. And now imagine that you're some writer who's just kind of started their career. Maybe you kind of had one or two stories under your belt and a studio executive says you have 10 days. Yeah. And and then you wonder why stories come out with like pasted on bad, you know, because. <laughs> yeah. Like... yeah, it really is that way. Yeah. So, and I finally got it. I, I love these first three chapters now and, and everybody who's now had the chance to read them are very happy with them. Um, but it's taken me longer to get into it than, than that. All right. Yeah. So that's, that's that rabbit chase, but let's, let's get back onto the endings. Um, you know, the, the thing that I want to talk about in the beginning of this, that I think that, that you can't have a discussion about endings because endings aren't endings. Endings are culminations of beginnings. And so I think that if you don't set things up correctly, that your endings are always going to fall flat. Yeah. So the ending must start in the beginning. You must know where you're going with that because you must lay in these things. So you know, we talked before the show, I want to talk about um, the the kind of three layers. And, and this was something that both of us kind of discovered a different way of thinking about this when we were doing the research on this. Um, cause you know, we've always talked about theme and we talk about thematic element and we talk about the story delivering that theme. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we discovered in our research was kind of a different way to look at that. Why don't you kind of let, like answer, what is, what do you think that is? What are those three layers that, that we're now looking at? So, um, the way that uh we would normally look at them is the way that we would break them up in, in the terminology that we use is character character growth arcs um plot and theme but there's a youtuber called tyler maury who had a great uh structure for for this and he called it the external stakes which is our plot the internal stakes which is the character growth arc and the philosophical stakes, which is the theme, the what is the big question you're asking. Um, and your ending has to resolve all three of those things. But in order to resolve it, you have to set the stakes at the start, right? Because your ending is the culmination. So if your character is growing from, let's take an example from Avatar The Last Airbender, the, the, the cartoon, um, Sokka grows to not be a misogynist. So he has to start the beginning of the of the series as a misogynist and then go through various growth points to the end where he's not. And that's a that's the internal stakes yep. for that character. Yeah, where the character growth are. Yes. So yeah, I really like that. I really like the because I think so many writers, I mean, we think about it just kind of innately. So yeah. when we talk about the, the physical layer, the story layer, we know we're talking about both the character internal growth and whatever the external stakes are. You yes. know, obviously the external stakes on the last Airbender cartoon is not becoming a non-misogynist. Like, no. that like that's not no. going to save the world or change the world in any way. It changes yeah. him. So... You know, we just innately know that those two layers and are I kind think of there. So, yeah. What I like about splitting them to think about is I think that it helps the writer understand that the internal growth arc is not the plot. Yes. You need both of these things. There's the internal growth arc. There's the thematic message. And there's the plot. All three need to come to a conclusion. They need to be a supported conclusion where they are, they support each other, but they are not the same thing. Your character learning to throw a better fireball so that he can defeat the monster at the end of the uh, story is not an internal growth arc. That is all plot. It's also it's not a thematic element. 
Yes, it's not automatic element. That's all plot. That's, I need to throw a better fireball. I go learn to throw a better fireball. I'm a better mage because of it. I have better physical capabilities. I defeat the monster. That's all plot. And that's going to be a very flat story for the reader. There's yes. nothing there to be moved by. I mean, that's the thing is these three layers are integral, uh, integrally uh, connected, intimately connected. They're intimately connected. The problem is, let's say that this character is a, um, I don't know. Let let's say they're a. They 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 don't they don't know they have no confidence in themselves, and part of their journey is supposed to learn confidence. Right. Okay. Um, let's say you didn't have the fireball and the monster. Well, no. Let's you let's go with that. The, you, let's go with that. That's a good physical. That's a good physical layer. Um, no, 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 no. But, but my point is, like, if you just had the growth arc with oh, none right, of the right, right, physical right, right, right. plot layer, right, then, right, then you're then you're telling a different boring story. Like, yeah. the, then you're basically just going like, like, look at the look at the growth, look at the growth. Right. But hundred percent, it's so that, that the plot? Case, what you're talking <laughs> about is so we have this kid who wants to be a mage, but he doesn't have the confidence he can do it. And so he he literally sits there and talks to himself, or maybe talks to his cousin, and eventually realizes that maybe he could do it if he if he really applied himself. And yay, look at me, I've gained confidence. End of the story. And, and then he yeah. goes and does it. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it's it's it has to be this. So just looking at these two layers, since that's what we've talked about. The internal growth arc of this character gaining confidence in themselves has to be intimately linked with the fact that we need to master Fireball so that we can become a master wizard so that we can beat the the, the monster that's threatening the world. Yeah. They both have to happen simultaneously, and they both have to move the reader. But now yeah. there's that third layer, which is what is the thematic element that we're going over so let's just be simple here since we're kind of got a simple story so yeah. maybe the thematic element we're playing with is the basic simplistic good versus evil why do we got to get this monster because it is the epitome of evil it kills without remorse it kills without reason it doesn't need it to eat or anything like that it's just this it hates everything and you know our character is going to represent you know sacrificing himself for the safety of others, you know, to be the good role model. And so now that gives us that third layer. And so all three layers have to grow and develop simultaneously so that they all are concluded in a way that's satisfying to the reader. Because if you don't have a thematic element, then you have a Michael Bay picture. And really, Michael Bay doesn't even have internal arc. Like a lot of times it's just the external yeah. conflict. I mean, that's what happens in a lot of Michael Bay movies. Um, some movies add in the internal growth arc. So you have the internal and the external, but you have no thematic message. And so therefore it still doesn't walk, you know, no one walks away with it. It's when you get all three of those that the story shines for the audience. Those are the ones that rise above, you know, the difference, because there's 800,000 stories hit the, hit amazon every single year yeah M most of them are instantly forgettable yeah. because they're not hitting all three layers of what you need to do for the story yeah so i i think that is a, a really really solid way to think about uh your story and ending it because you do have to the end has to cement those three layers for the reader yeah it has to address your thematic question it has to cement the character growth and it has to deal with the plot threads all the plot threads if this is the ending ending <laughs> don't leave dangling plot plot, plot threads yeah and let's get into that later because i still think we're in the defining stage because there's mm -hmm. another mistake that i think a lot of people make on these as a matter of fact in the writer's room um last couple of writing sessions i've been working with someone on this very very thing so another thing is lack of focus stories aren't reality stories are windows into 
whatever we're doing. So these three layers that we're talking about, you know, the plot, the plots or the external stakes, the growth, the character internal growth arc or the internal stakes, and then the theme or the philosophical stakes, you know, as that other YouTuber talk, called them. The, I think the important thing for each one of those is you should be able to, at the end of the story, answer the question, were these stakes solved or not? Like the reader should be able to go, you know, it's like if we look at Star Wars, obviously the external story arc is um, we have an empire that is threatening the rebels and it's going to take over the universe and kill everybody and put, put everybody under a tyrannical thumb. So do we defeat the empire? Period. I mean, that's that's the yeah, question. Yeah. And, you know, the answer is yes, we blow up the Death Star. We defeat them. But that's a physical layer. It's If that's all the movie was, that's pretty weak. The internal growth arc for Luke Skywalker is an internal... Um, kind of what we were talking about with the fireball story. It's believing in yourself. It's do you have confidence in your ability to actually do this? Yes, you start as a farm boy, but can you actually be a warrior? Can you actually start this this path? And he does. He takes up the, the mantle. He flies the ship. He goes into battle and he you know is the one who delivers the killing blow. And then on the message side, the thematic side, we're dealing with should you rely on technology or should you rely on faith? And do we have an answer to that? Yes. He turns off his targeting computer. He believes in a power greater than himself. He has faith and he uses that faith or relies on that faith to help him win the day. And yeah. so we have all three of those layers being set up at the beginning, work through, through the entire story. And then each one of them has a resolution that the reader can point to and go yes or no. Yes, we blew up the Death Star. No, we didn't blow up the Death Star. Yes, Luke Skywalker has got the confidence that he can be a warrior. No, he doesn't. Yes, he's relied on faith. No, he hasn't. Like, I think that's the thing that so many writers mistake. Stories and, aren't about reality. They're, and, they're it's yeah. reality's too complex. It's too big. It's too insane. Everything has to come to a point, a yes or no binary choice which doesn't happen in the real world. And so, so many stories are ruined because writers are trying to tell reality, but that's not what a story is. Yes. And I think it's important to remember that, like this, this setting, especially in our genre, in fantasy, the setting, the story, all of it, it is there to serve the delivery of your plot and your characters and your theme. That's its purpose. It is not reality. Right. If you choose to incorporate things from our history because, you know, realism or whatever, the, the longer I'm doing this, the more I'm like, realism is totally the most ridiculous reason to include anything in a fantasy setting. Because... Its purpose is not to be realistic. Its purpose is to deliver the story. Yeah, its its purpose is to impact the reader. Yeah. So if it's realistic that you have, you know, whatever, like whatever, whatever historical deviation you want to put in, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. And whatever thing that you choose to include from our history you are choosing to do that. You, the author, like no one's forcing you. There's no stick that says you must include this. It's your choice. So two stories, one more of a Drakeism. It's one of the reasons why I say you never want to be hundred percent accurate in anything that you do Yeah. Um, because it's boring and only experts are going to understand the reality of what you're doing. You know, so the, the, what was the Mars story? Um, that um, Matt Damon. But the, the potato thing. I don't know. Yeah. I didn't see yeah, it. Yeah. I, 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 he gets left on Mars and he has to try and yeah, yeah. everyone thinks he's dead. Um, I can't, I mean, life on Mars is stuck in my head, but that's not, that's a show that has nothing to do with Mars at all. It's has to do with time traveling back to the 1970s. Um, um, uh, the Martian. Thank you very Martian. much. Brian. I appreciate that. Uh, so, the Martian, 
like oh, so many people watched that and they were like, oh my God, this was so scientifically factual. It was so real. And then NASA came out with like a 30 page letter that was like, here's all the scientifically inaccuracies that are in this, but that's just it. Only NASA scientists are going to know that it's wrong. And if you did it right, it wouldn't be as impactful on the audience. So, you know, it's the same thing with what we're talking about here. But here was here's a great lesson. So when when I was working on the realm, we're talking a massive story. It's the biggest thing I've ever created. Who knows if it'll ever actually get written now, but I spent three years working on it. And so hopefully one day I will get the time to write it, even though it's kind of falling apart for now. Um, but it's this massive epic story with eight trilogies that all are individual standalone trilogies that all tie in together and all come together in one big climactic ending. And I don't think my protégés really ever realized how hard it was to get there because I kept going, yeah, but what's the thing? What's the thing, the on-off switch at the end of this, the yes-no binary choice like, yeah, we're we're destroying an entire world and we're bringing in eight different aspects of this world. And, you know, there's eight different magic systems and eight different cultures and eight different races and eight different everythings. Great. But at the end of the day, it has to be a binary choice. It has to be a yes, no, light switch on, off. And so it's really easy for writers to create. And that's the problem with, George Martin, I pick on him all the time. He never comes to a point. He just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows his story. That's why season eight of Game of Thrones was never going to be good because you've just gone so far out that there's I no I will way dispute that. I could have made that thing good. I could have made it good. With more time. <laughs> you couldn't, I don't think you could have done it in season eight, but if you had had, if you could have done it by season 12. I will just say again that those writers were offered additional seasons. HBO put no pressure. They were like, you want more oh. money? You can have more money. You can have more money. You can have more time. You can have additional episodes. You can have additional seasons. Wow. They, those two little buggers, were like, <laughs> no, we're done. We want to go make Star Wars. Yeah. So, no, 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 no. They do not get out of it that easy. No, that's fine. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying you can't do it in one more one more percent hundred percent but uh, i agree with that but but, but you but could have george ended martin, that story but george martin hasn't finished anything i mean we we pick on game of thrones because yeah. the the most well known but his wild card series is the same way he just kept building out and out and out and out and out and then you just can't and that's what happens to him he reaches the point where he's like well there's no way to bring this together now and so i quit and so that's what he does he just keeps going out until he quits and I think so. And it's not just a series, though, that you have to think about that. Now, we do because we write epic fantasy. So we're constantly thinking we want to build the world really big, but eventually we have to come to a binary choice. Mm -hmm. Like, but every novel needs to work that way. Your novel, your short story, your novella. I mean, this novella that I'm writing for uh, Harn World, I'm, I start at a point, I build out, 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 but I turn and I come to a binary choice at the end. Like, the an audience can't consume more than that. It will not impact them if it's not a binary choice at the end. Now, not saying that you can't have, you know, a threesome choice or whatever, but the more complex you make it, the more esoteric it's going to be, and the less this... audience, the less the mass audiences are going to be able to consume this. Every so this... story will find an audience. This actually segues nicely into one of the things that I want to discuss, which is the complexity with ending political fantasy. Mm, yeah. Really any political novel, but political fantasy, because, you know, we're fantasy writers. Now, Although, political full fantasy. Although, disclosure, this is all you, because I don't do any <laughs> political stuff at all. <laughs> I hate so, politics. Political fantasy is not a normal fantasy story that has politics in it. Okay, that, that's not a political fantasy. Political fantasy is literally like House of the Dragon. There is no external force. There are multiple factions vying for control. Right? Maybe there is, you know, someone who is trying to overthrow the government. So you've got revolutionaries or you've got rebellions or things like that. And then you've got the, the government forces. And 
normally with these stories, what you do is you have POV characters on both sides of the conflict. Okay, you've got POV characters on the bad side and POV characters on the good side. And you can have all kinds of action in political fantasies because war is a political act. So you can, you know, you can have wars and all of that kind of action, but the, the essence of it. Hmm? Assassinations and intermarriage. Assassinations, all of that, all of that yeah. kind of action stuff. Yeah. But it is ultimately a, a, a combat between human factions for control of, of like a government or whatever. And you have two problems with it. The, the first is that if you're writing political fact, the fantasy and you then introduce an external element, it's very easy for that external element to take over and it then turns from a political fantasy into a kind of more epic or adventure fantasy and you might lose your readers who, I mean, because a, a political fantasy reader is a, is a very specific beast. Yeah. <laughs> like, and they don't want their political fantasy to suddenly turn into like an adventure fantasy. Like that, that's not on their menu. Um, and you, but your other problem is it is really, really hard to end such a complex story because you've now built, let's say six, seven factions who are all vying for control, right? You've got POV characters and all of that. How do you end that in a way that satisfies the reader? And bear in mind that the best political fantasies would end in a way that ch that introduces change into the society. So whether it's, you know, a change in a government or like a change of the people in the government or something, right? They, because you you want that kind of like, or like the, the, the nothing changes, but that's also a nothing, you, you know. And the problem is that comes with its own complexities because you know, now now you're like there's a never ending element here. Let's say you've won the revolution. Yeah, but now what? You know, <laughs> like, like you don't just introduce democracy and tomorrow we're all dancing through the streets going, democracy is great. That's not how political change works. <laughs> yeah. Um so I mean, this, so this... it is a very difficult beast to end properly. And I think one of the biggest problems is Political fantasy readers don't boil their questions, that don't boil their theme down enough. They focus on the growth, they focus on the characters and the plot, and those they do very well. But what is your thematic question in this political fantasy? Is it that power always triumphs? Is it like, what? what, what is the thematic element? And if you can answer that thematic element in how you end your political fantasy, I think you can have a good ending. But you must commit to it. Okay? If your theme is like it's a grim, dark kind of theme of like everybody is um, terrible people or whatever, you need to commit to it on a Joe Abercrombie level. Mm -hmm. And the characters all just suffer in the end because <laughs> that's, you know. Or yeah. if your theme is like, you know, if if enough people stand up to to tyranny, it is overthrown. You must commit to it. The tyrant must be overthrown. You know, the whatever, like the. Well, it goes. It goes exactly what we were talking about earlier about the yeah. focus. It has to end up being a binary. Can, can we point to these layers? You know, you mm. have your plot. Now your plot is much bigger because we have so many different characters that are all. They're not even working toward the same goal. Yes. Each one is working toward their own goal, which is maybe. Uh, antithetical to the other POV's goals. Yeah. But can we point to it and go, is it resolved? You know, did this character kill the other characters? Whatever. Uh, we have the internal growth arcs, uh, which may be a societal thing, depending on what you're doing. And then you have the message thing. But each one of them, you're literally saying the same thing that I would do in an epic fantasy. You're going through the three layers and you're trying to get to the point where the reader can say, yes, I understand this and how it how it is resolved. Doesn't mean it's good or bad. It just means it's resolved. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, they blew up the Death Star. No, they didn't blow up the Death Star. You know, yeah. yes, they chose faith. No, they didn't choose faith. It doesn't matter what the choice is. That that what the what the answer is is going to dictate whether you're writing 
a feel good story or a tragedy. But both stories are fantastic. Tragedies move people just as much as feel-good stories. Feel-good stories yeah. are just easier, in my opinion, to write. Um, so that's really what you're saying. You're still saying the same thing. I, I am. It's just, it is more complicated because you're often your characters will be in conflict with each other and they'll be in conflict until the end. So it yeah. is hard to craft a satisfying ending for the reader, given that they might very well be liking more of the guy on the other side. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't call this a political fantasy, but mm -hmm. Thieves World, which was um, pretty much spearheaded by, um, by Aspirin. And he got a bunch of, you know, good, solid fantasy writers back in the eighties. And they, this is before the internet. So they were doing it all over mail, snail mail, but each one of them came up with a character in this city they kind of fleshed the city out together. And then the rule was you can use anyone else's characters in any way, shape, or form, including killing them. But then it became canon. And so each one of them wrote a story with their character, the POV, but all the other characters were secondary characters in theirs. And so I remember because each writer is writing their character with their love and passion. And then that character just gets killed in another story. And you're just like, Ow, that hurts. I really like that character. And now they're they're dead. And the you know, all the writers had agreed that this is just what's gonna do. So you just create a new character. You keep you're still a writer in it. You just now have to have something different. So I really like that series. Um and again, I wouldn't call it political fantasy. Yeah, but it is it it does it does speak to the problem. Right. You know, with, with political fantasy. Yeah. Right. Um, it still comes down to focus. It still comes yeah. down to the a writer needs to understand that a story has a job to do. And as with every job, like you're either going to build the wall or you're not going to build the wall. You're either going to give the customer a hamburger or you're not going to give the customer a hamburger. You're either going to fix the car or you're not going to fix the car. It's a job. And so stories have a job to do and that is impact the reader and how you do it is these three levels and focusing down to a binary choice do they succeed or do they fail and then depending on which way you go is what type of story you're telling whether it's feel good or or a tragedy and i think that's the biggest thing that so many people miss with their endings is they one they don't focus on all three levels they either just completely, and theme, unfortunately, is the one that most people just just don't even think about, and it just never happens. And so that's where you get the weak story that has no meat. Um, but that's really it. It's 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 looking at all three of those things. Um, now, there is a caveat to that. External story arcs. External okay. story arcs don't have character growth. Sure. You take something like Lord of the Flies, Jack and Ralph, they're not characters. They're not going to grow. They can't grow because they're allegories. And that's the only problem with a external story arc is that your characters are allegories. But I think that's the reason why external story arcs like Lord of the Flies or V for Vendetta are never going to be as financially successful yeah. as an internal story arc like your Star Wars or your you know Lord of the Rings or or Indiana Jones or whatever. And it's because we're not given one of those three layers. So therefore, we can never play with it. So therefore, the audience, they don't know it, but they subconsciously feel it. Yeah. And so it's just not going to impact them at the, the depth that having that, that third layer, that internal story arc is going to do. It's not to say don't do an external story arc. Just mm. when you do it, you need to understand you have lost 33% of your ability to impact the reader. And that's just it, which is why so few of them actually rise to the top. Your Lord of the Rings, your FIFA Vendetta, stuff like that. They rise to the top. Uh, but for Lord, every... Lord of the Flies. Not Lord I'm sorry, Lord of the, the Flies. Rings, the Ring has an internal arc. Right, sorry, <laughs> Lord of the Flies. Um, but that's, I mean, I guarantee you for every, you know, FIFA Vendetta or Lord of the Flies, there is a thousand internal story arcs out there that 10 people read yeah absolutely 
and they were th- those 10 people were not impacted by it yeah so you really have to shine on the thematic element and the um the actual external story fire. arcs are so hard yeah because because not only do you run the risk of um you know not not getting your ending right because you're working with 33 percent less but you also run the risk of like overdoing it like over baking your theme um and and you know then it feels like a sledgehammer to the face as opposed to like a a subtle part of the story yeah so that segues it is, into a, some... it is a hard thing to do well that segues nicely into something i want to talk about which right. is and i don't understand this i do not understand why so many people do this but basically if at the end of your story you then have to spend time explaining to your story why they should be impacted by the journey they just took. And this comes into play with, with epilogues so often where it's like, I mean, for as great as the Harry Potter series is, I do not feel this, the last book in that series did it justice. And one of the weakest parts of that is the epilogue where you get to see Harry married to Ginny and they're dropping their kids off to, you know, platform, whatever, in three quarters. I don't remember what it was. Um, nine and three quarters. And and absolutely three quarters. nothing has changed, except we now have good people in charge of the Ministry of Magic. <laughs> but it's also, that wasn't, you could tell what that, what the author was doing with that. She was going, I'm going to put a nail in this coffin because I never want to write in this world again. So let me close this in a way so that nobody can ask me for more. Now, she later regretted that, which is why she ended up writing more stuff in it. Um, I don't ever want to destroy one of my IPs. I mean, I'd like to be able to go back to it if I so choose. Um, But really the, the, the worst offenders of these are your murder mysteries. Yeah. Where at the end of it, the last one is, okay, everyone gather around while Perot tells you what actually happened. And you're the murderer. And it's like, that's why when you get something like a Knives Out or -hmm. something like that, Although Knives Out kind of did it in the same way. I don't know. Maybe that's why I'm not such a huge murder mystery fan. Because at the end of so many of them, you just get puked at what it, what you should have known, what you should have found, what you should have gotten. You yeah. should not have to explain things to the audience if you did your story right. If you do the setup, if you set up and say, hey, look, the external conflict is going to be there's an empire that is very dangerous, that's going to kill innocent people. What is the internal story arc? This character does not feel that they can ever make an impact on this whatsoever. What's the thematic element? Well, we start off with technology. We're going to introduce faith at the very beginning, you know, with the whole Obi-Wan. It surrounds you. It it penetrates you. It's in us. It's Mm -hmm. outside of us. It's everywhere. It's nowhere. You can see it. You can't see it. You can feel it. You can't feel it. You know, all that stuff. We set all those things up. And then we go through and we focus on them and we get answers to them at the end. Um, if you do that correctly, you should not have to go and then explain to your audience what the deal was in the story. I think like that epilogue of Harry Potter, if there had been an epilogue to show actual time passing, right and there was like i don't know elven uh, like like house elf people dropping house elf kids off at the station right that would have been an epilogue worth reading because now because you can't do that immediately after the story right that sort of change takes time right but now you're like okay the house elves have actually followed in Dobby's footsteps and they've gotten freedom for themselves from like the oppression of the wizards and you actually see the change starting. 
See, I would have been on board of, for that epilogue. <laughs> that's more of a return. That's more of a what is life like now for the hero after yeah. the adventure is over. So 100%. But the thing is, it's such a long period. Like you've got to get so you've got to let like 20 years odd pass, right? And I mean, so like, I know you can do it in a chapter, but I personally would probably have made that call to make it an epilogue because of the time passage. Yeah. Or maybe to even switch briefly into like a, a elven head just for the epilogue to show you that moment. Mm -hmm. I can see some some advantage and disadvantage of that, but yeah. this is not the time or the place to talk about yeah. that. Um, my point was just. The problem was what she tried to do with that epilogue is she tried to show character growth. See, I feel like all she was trying to do was just try to tell the reader, I don't want to do this anymore. No, because because she was she was Harry was telling his kid that these are the headmasters I knew best. These are these are the guys you named for and you'll be brave and it's OK to be in Slytherin. She was showing like, remember, in first year where he's like, what if I'm in Slytherin? It's terrible. And then here it's OK to be in Slytherin. That's basically the, the growth arc demonstration. Right. It's like it is Slytherin's not all bad is, is the arc there and that's what she's trying to cement there because nowhere in the books has she made it that Slytherin is okay every single Slytherin bar Draco right at the end and Snape right at the end are the epitome of jerk faces right? that's where I was going with that yeah she never, never did explained. that arc, so then she jams it in into the epilogue. <laughs> and that's where I was going with that. You never, again, like I said, if you have to explain it to what they should feel yeah. and what they should have learned, then you have failed. Yeah. The story should do that. It should allow for that to happen. When that story ends, like when Star Wars ends, you get you get some medals. Mm. You don't need anything other than that. You get you get to watch them smile and laugh, and and that's all we need. We just need that moment of yeah. And that's quarter like I love what you know you call it room to breathe, and that's really what it is. It's just you're giving the reader okay. We've now done this thing. Now let's mm -hmm. take a breath. Now let's actually take a breath and go okay. It's all cool. Um, yeah. and it allows them to revel in their victory and feel like they've had a job well done and then they can put the book down they can put the movie down whatever and they can walk away and they feel fulfilled by that journey and yeah, i think exactly. that's where so many people just they go oh well, i didn't do my job well enough so let me just have this character start narrating you know what they should have gotten what the reader yeah. should have gotten out of this journey so i just it's just something i want to talk about i, I think that it's something that if that's if you get to the end of your story and you start feeling like you have to tell the reader stuff, then just don't do that and go back and figure out where you can organically. I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why the mystery writers do it. They do it because, like, it's it's basically to show the reader the clues. They're not doing it from a character growth perspective. They're doing it from a plot perspective, so that the reader doesn't have to go crawl back through the story to pick up all the clues that the actual detective picked up on, basically. Right. That's that's their purpose in, in kind of the the Perot explains or the uh who's the other Sherlock explains, you know, etc. Um and, and that's I, why Sherlock and Holmes has a conversation at the end where like right. Sherlock explains it. It's the same as the epilogue, right? As Perot's epilogue. I'm yeah. not gonna say that that's wrong for mystery. I'm gonna say it's definitely wrong for me as a reader, because I don't read mysteries and there's a reason for it, because I always feel Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it, it doesn't work. I mean, I've read all the Sherlock Holmes, so I guess at some level at least it did work for me, but it's not something that I generally read. Um, but but that is, that is also to me, that is a different thing from what you're talking about, which is the, I didn't do a growth arc, so let me, let me insert it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, or I didn't cement the growth arc, you know. Um, so there's a there's a couple more things on my notes that I kind of want to talk about. I think there's three things, four things that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you have something 
Or no? Just something? Go for it. All right. So, so we talked about the three different layers and, and coming up with the end. And I've talked about this in certain ways before, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit different. So if we have an emotional baseline of where our readers are, then as the story is going on, the lows are going to come below that baseline and the highs are going to come above that baseline. Yeah. And the reason why I say that it's all about going as low as you can possibly go. I mean, like the reason why I almost graze the side of horror on some of my low scenes is because I want to take you as far down as I can so that when we come up to the top and we have the highs, everything is relative to the reader. So if their baseline is here and I took them all the way down here and then took them all the way up here, then their emotional distance mm -hmm. between the bottom and the top feels to them massive as opposed to if I just had something, you know, kind of bad happen and then something kind of good happen. And, and even if I do have something kind of bad happen and something really good happen, that is still less of a distance, an emotional distance than if I had taken them even lower. It's the reason why, you know, especially in the genres that we play in, death, loss, sacrifice, these things are so important. And so to make your end really sing these three different things, it is about not just setting them up. And you know, we have to set up all three of them. We have to let the reader know, here is what the external problem is going to be. The, the things that are externally at stake. Here's the internally the stuff that is at stake. And here is the thematic thing that I'm going to be teaching you, even though that is the hardest because that's almost a subtext. So you can't flat out state it. Mm -hmm. But like Star Wars, most people don't even know the theme is between technology and uh, faith. So that is really subtextual throughout the entire thing. Uh, the only time it's in your face is at the very end when Obi-Wan is in one ear and Princess Leia is in the other and it's technology faith. That's it. That's the only time that it's actually in your face. But not only do we need to set those up and then come to a binary decision at the end, whether it's successful or fails, the big thing is the setbacks that the that the that the character is going to face the harsher they are the more they lose the more they sacrifice the the better it's going to feel when i hit those highs so it's why i always push that your character should feel like they are earning everything they get because they have suffered so greatly and again, does this work in every episode? No, of course not. Or um, uh, genre? I said episode. Does this work in every genre? No, of course not. But we write epic fantasy. And so I'm assuming that a lot of the people that are listening to us are down that sci-fi fantasy adventure, you know, kind of, of path. And so that is the reason why you cannot baby your readers. You cannot fantasy fulfill within your characters. I Sorry, I said baby readers. You can't baby your characters. They are not real. And so when you fall in love with them, you know, one of my protégés, I have, it's been one of his biggest problems as a writer, his entire career is he really loves his characters. And so he doesn't like doing bad things to them. And so the highs just don't feel as high as they could actually feel, you know, you should destroy your characters so that when they do come out on top, it feels monumentally different between those highs and the lows. And so it's it's one of the reasons why the all hope is lost moment at the end of the story is so important. You know, we're, we're supposed to blow up the Death Star and save the world. Everyone dies. Everyone. Red Leader dies. I guess I think Red Leader lives, but all of his friends die. All these people get blown up. And at the end of it, he's going to die. Luke is dead. Darth Vader is on his tail. Darth Vader is the best of the best. Nothing can stop him. My targeting computer is about to lock in on you, even though it looks like it was made from the 1950s. Um, and you're going to die. There's nothing that's going to save you. Like nothing. There's not even, because Han Solo left. There's no one. And then the rescue from without. And you're like, oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Han. 
that's why it impacts us because it is so low that then when he makes the shot, the distance between the low and the high is what we're trying to, to really focus in on here. Not just that there's a high and a low. And that's why the all hope is lost moment right before the climax, because the climax, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about here, but we did talk about in the climax episode is the unfortunateness of how quickly the climax happens. Mm. Like there's really no way to draw out a climax The the, the, character realizes they're on the wrong side of the theme they move to the right side of the theme they take all their lessons learned and they apply them to overthrowing overcome you know overcoming beating whatever the thing yeah. and then that's it it's over like you can't draw that out they've made the decision they do it they win we we launch the torpedo it blows up the death star that's it like the climax very short um and like we said the, the last time there's definitely a sex joke in there um <laughs> it's very short but because it's so short, that's why the all hope is lost moment, which happens right before the climax, is so vitally important. When you take them to the depths of despair, I'm here to save my wife. You can't. I'm about to put a bullet in her head. She's surrounded by 50 people. You can't have her. You're going to die now. She's going to die or live the rest of her life suffering. There's nothing you can do. All hope is lost. Like you have no weapon. You came here with all these weapons. Now we've taken them all from you. We've tied you up. We've beaten you. You cannot have this. Like the more horrible the all hope is lost moment is, but but it's it's not just the all hope is lost moment. It's every setback. The more sacrifice that every setback forces the re the character to have, the higher the emotional impact of the win is. And that's one of the reasons why I'm such a dark writer is because those victories feel monumental when you claw your way out of the pit of hell. And so that's another thing that I just don't think a lot of, of writers do. They just, they don't let their characters sacrifice enough. They don't let them live in misery enough they don't let them work hard enough they kind of fantasy fulfill like oh i kind of am my character and and i don't want to be mean to me so yeah. you know what i mean yeah um i i i do agree with that uh to uh to a certain extent um i also feel like it's important to note that sometimes you can have that kind of like all hope is lost moment in a different place and in a different way. So I was I was thinking about what you're saying while comparing it to to a, a book that has a darkness that's defeated in the middle and then a very long process where you take the lessons that you learned out of defeating this darkness, you take it to go and get a thing that then brings you full circle back home that allows you to free, to, to write an injustice. That is. At yeah, home. That's but that's just it. Thing. You're actually just talking about a, a, another setback. So that darkness, defeating the darkness in the middle of the story is not your all hope is lost moment. hundred percent. But really that, but that's setback. yes and no. So the thing is that darkness is actually a world ending event. And the thing you do at the end is actually just a personal stakes thing. I can see that, but still okay. the story is about the personal stakes. hundred percent. So the story is about the personal stakes, but the, the, the moment in the darkness is in and of itself, like that whole section of the book, because it, it's not, it's not like one chapter. We're talking like chapters, right, 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 is incredibly dark. And there's a, there are moments where all hope is lost in there and you don't know how the characters are going to get out. You're like, they're now, going to die here. I'm assuming <laughs> you're talking about a real story, but I'm going to yes. just use it as a as a mental exercise. So yes. if we look at these things, the external plot arc of this character probably isn't about that darkness. It's about something else. It's and about the growth. The the well, she has to learn a lesson in that darkness. She has to learn how to empty herself out so that she can carry the name of God. But it still isn't the external stakes. 
Yes. More than likely at the beginning of that, some external stakes were shown to the reader that were beyond that moment. So that's really yeah. more of a mid-act to climax. It's just yes. a very, very, very big, heavy, world-defying <laughs> mid-act to climax. But yes. it's, that's, it still feeds into exactly what I'm saying. So we yeah. still have the external stuff that's different. It's going to, we know it's going to go past that because it isn't resolved in that. We have mm -hmm. an internal that isn't resolved in that. And again, I don't know this story. And yeah. then the thematic elements isn't resolved in that. So yeah, yeah. it's still just another scene of setbacks. Now, in that case, it's huge, <laughs> but it's still just another setback within the story. It's yeah. a, um, you know, what are... It, we, it's a mid, it's a mid act two scene climax that most authors would have made the end of their book. Right. Like I, I'll get you that. <laughs> but I mean, it's still just Obi Wan is killed. Um, we got trapped inside of an asteroid. We got like these. I'm just going through the little setbacks. Yeah, yeah no, no, hundred percent, hundred percent. But it's it is like it was. It was so dark that when they escaped out of that thing, when when they make it out, it. It is such a deep relief. And then because it was in the middle of the book rather than the end, you had a whole book to deal with PTSD. Yeah. Like a whole half a book to deal with PTSD, which was amazing in and of itself. Yeah. Um, so there's there's two ways that we could have that we could approach that. We could yeah. set up external, internal, thematic um stakes that are going to resolve in that big climax. Yeah. Call that book one and then do a book two afterwards. Yes. Or we could do it the way you're you're doing it there. But now the way you're doing it there means that the external, internal, and thematic stakes were set up that had that never got resolved in that middle part because that's yeah. not the story. So again, it's still about focus. Even though we have this big world shattering thing and the end of it is more personal, mm. we know as the audience, we would not have been fulfilled if the book yeah. ended after the big thing, the way it was written there it would feel like half a story even though correct the conflict because feels like it's big enough to be the end of a because story because at the opening of the story you know that okay, so it's Kashil's avatar right so and at the opening of the story phaedra is set up so that her her friend sacrificed himself he's sitting on an island where he's the master of straits so he's got like all this power but he can't leave the island and he will not die but he gets older Okay, so he's mortal and aging, but deathless. Stuck on an island. You're going to become the crypt keeper. That, that's a lot of sacrifice, you know, and he did that for her. So at the, at the, the book opens with her like having a dream that, and I know, never open a dream, but it really worked. Having a dream that's like, basically says you have an opportunity to free him. And that's kind of, that sets the stakes. That is the stakes for the books is, is getting Hyacinth off the island. And then saving the world in Darsanga is like a thing she has to do along the way. Yeah, but you just, yeah. I mean, you just nailed it. Exactly yeah. what we've been saying. Uh, she set the stakes of a story that had nothing to do with saving the world. Yeah. That had to do with something. And since that doesn't happen, now we could also have it happen during that big climax. But that's sure. the point. The point of all of this is focus. Like every bit of us, you want to have a successful story, you have to understand that you're not writing reality. Yeah. You're writing a thing to impact an audience. That's it. And so they can't, an audience, a, a reader can't consume reality in, the, in a story. It just doesn't exist. It's not, I know we want to do it and we're like, oh, but we want it to be like real life. And I think that's another reason why um, a lot of stories today are failing is because they're they're trying to do too much in the story as opposed to understanding that stories are a very limited medium. Yes. I, this, I so agree. There is so many stories that have got so much plot jammed into them. I call them overstuffed plot lines. Yeah. You've taken so much plot and jammed it in there. And I keep saying this is one of the things with Rings of Power that I felt as well. Like, there was at least one storyline too many in that thing. At, at least, least one. <laughs> at least. Yeah. 
but the, the problem is there was just too much going on and so nothing had time Right. So either they needed less storylines or they needed to not forge the rings in that season because that was part of the problem. Yeah. It was all too fast. Right. And and you've got to give these things time to breathe. If I compare this with Blue Eyed Samurai, there were three main characters, three storylines. That's it. And it worked in the same amount of episodes because they kept the storyline simple enough to work each storyline got the screen time it needed yeah i mean as insane as the realm sounds when i tell people there's eight pov characters i also am doing it over 20 novels yeah so i get that eight is a lot but i give them the time that each one of them can grow and breathe and and all of that um i i have two uh, two last things um and the one is the last. So uh, anything have, have come up on you that you want to find? So I think another big mistake that people make with the endings falls into convenience. Making the ending too easy for the reader, too easy for the character, too easy. I, you know, we and it's not just us. So many people have said this. Never take your first idea. Like if you're if you're presented with a problem in your story, don't go, oh, this is how I'm gonna fix it, and then do that. Because more than likely, subconsciously, you've just picked the cliche way that's been done thousands of other times in other stories that you've read, and you just didn't realize it. Um here's here's the biggest, this is a little offshoot, but it's kind of it was freaky weird. So my history with Harn World. I found Harn World back in the back of Dragon Magazine, it was a small Canadian company, and it seemed like a really cool, really well-detailed out world. And so I started ordering it. Just a, it was just a campaign world. I was 12, 13, somewhere around in there. But back then, it was very feudal. It didn't have a lot of magic. It didn't have a lot of monsters. And so when I took it to my friends that played D&D, they were like, yeah, I don't want to play in that world. I don't want to play in a world that's basically just peasants and feudal systems and all that. But I kept buying it because it was really cool. And then I bought everything they had, and then life went on. It's all just sitting over there on my shelf. Um, and then about three, four, five years ago, they started kickstarting new versions of their old stuff, but as hardbacks, so like this. And I was like, you know what? I already own everything that they have. I read it back when I was 12. I haven't read it since then, but whatever. I'll, I'll throw 50 bucks at it. And so that's exactly what happened. The book would come in and I would go, ooh, nostalgia. And I would flip through. I wouldn't read anything. I just flip through and go, oh, wow, look what they updated the maps and the art. And oh, that's really cool. And then I put it on the shelf. Four years later, five years later, now I'm working for them. And it was a really weird conversation to have with them because they were like, you know, we know you're a huge fan of ours. And I'm like, well, I mean, I throw a lot of money at you. <laughs> like, I haven't read this stuff since I was 12 or 13. So I'm going through working on this first story and I have, you know, I'm sending this, this stuff as I'm writing it to the dev team so they can, because I want to be 100% canon. Um, as we said on a couple episodes, it's really easy if you get hired to write in an IP like Star Wars or Marvel, or whatever, just do two things. Don't break canon and write a good story. And honestly, you really don't Actually, have to write a good story. I would say it's really, really, really hard in Marvel and Star Wars to do that because of the the the, the volume. Right. <laughs> and which anyway. version of canon? Where we? <laughs> right. I get that. But anyway, um, so I had written the word weak. Hmm. And the thing comes back and they haven't read my stuff, um, like the Genesis saga or anything like that. But it came back and they were like, Oh, we don't use week. We use 10 day. And I was like, are you serious? Because I use 10 day in the Genesis saga. Now I'm going, did I make that up like I thought I did? No, you probably or didn't. Um, did so I the subconsciously French... steal yeah. it from when I was 12? I don't know if you started from them, but I'll tell you something. The French after the French Revolution... Uh, tried to use a 10 day instead of a week. It, well, it didn't the, stick. The reason but... why I created it when I was working on the calendar for it is I just didn't want to deal with with math 
And so every month is 30 days long. Every day, you know, every week is 10 days long. Like I just didn't want to deal with it. And then when I was trying to name it, I was just like, I could come up. I don't want to call it a week because that'll be confusing because everyone will think it's seven days when it's actually 10. But I also don't want to come up with like a name, like a, a beak or, you know, a balik or whatever. Um, and so that's why I was just, well, there's 10 days in it. So I'll just call it a 10 day. So, I mean, I, I legitimately did make it up and this was yeah. 20 years after I read Harn World, but it was just weird that, so my point in going down that rabbit hole is I promise you every idea that you think that you're being so clever with probably already exists somewhere out there. <laughs> um, like, even if you think it's unique, it, it it's shocking when you run into something like that. You, so you you think this you think these are like I've had people comment at the bottom of my world building channel at, on on the videos and say like oh that magic system that you put in there that's my magic system I'm like well no see yeah. that's the thing like yeah these this knowledge that we all have like it's everybody's knowledge nobody yeah. is stealing from anybody here yeah you know, you're stealing from somebody if you like directly copy those ideas That's and those things. characters and those things. Yeah. Not like not when you amorphously absorb <laughs> elements of a magic system. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's just that's why it always breaks my heart when I'm at a writer's conference and I meet somebody and they're like, well, I haven't started writing yet. I'm waiting to come up with that unique idea. And it's like, mm -hmm. honey, yeah. um, that's not how this Raise works. Your heart. <laughs> yeah. It's not how this works. It's it and that's why in dynamic story creation I have that chapter called spaghetti. And I just talk yeah. about it's not about coming up with your own ingredients. It's about mixing the existing ingredients different than anybody else. That's really what you're trying to do. So the 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 to bring it back to here, it's about it's about convenience. So you talked about um I mean like some of the really horrible ones are um, and then the hero dies and wakes up in their bedroom and realizes the whole thing was a dream. Um, like, <laughs> you want to see me throw a book across the room? Give me that as the ending. <laughs> yeah. Um, or the Wizard of Oz, you know, the answer was inside of you the whole time. <laughs> um, and that's great for a children's book that was written back in the 30s. Yeah. Not good for today. So basically... The, the last thing I want to talk about other than the ending of this is, is just that. To, if it feels easy, I mean, I say this all the time in class. If you run into a problem that takes you weeks to figure out how to get past, those are going to be the most memorable moments in your story. Because remember, the audience gets to overcome that in minutes. They just get to read through it. And so they're going to go, oh, my goodness, this author is so brilliant to have come up with this thing that I like because they get there. They get to the same spot you got to. And they go, I have no idea how the character survives this. Like, there's no way. And that was the spot that you got into where you were like, oh, well, there's no way they're going to survive. Like, they're not. And so then you spend three, four weeks Instead of being lazy and just rewriting it and going, you know, just not letting that happen, you spend three or four weeks to figure out how to get them out of it. And you come up with this amazingly clever way that takes a lot of time to figure out. But the readers don't get that. They just see the instant happening. So they just assume that the reader puked the words out. And that's why I would say genius isn't written. Genius is edited. So yeah. don't go with convenience. Convenience is your enemy. If it is easy it is probably bad. That's just kind of the easiest way to say it. And, and that's the way it should feel with your ending. If your ending was really easy for you to come up with, more than likely it's going to be a bad ending. It's just not going to be impactful to the audience. Um, and then where I wanted to actually end this is how do we tell if we've been successful? And what I always say is you can't. You're not allowed the author, that's the biggest mistake overall that every author makes of every step of the creation process, in my opinion. They allow themselves 
to decide if this character is good, this scene is good, this story is good, this this sentence is good, this plot device is good. You don't get to decide any of that as the author. You don't get to decide if it's good. You can decide that you like it, but that doesn't mean that it's actually the right thing. The only people that have that ability are other readers, which is why you have to be in a critique group. You have to have beta readers. You have to test this stuff out because I don't care how much you love what you just did. If everyone else in the world hates it, you have failed and you will swallow your pride and you will rewrite it because it doesn't matter that you liked it. You're not writing for yourself. If you're writing for yourself, that's fine. And some people do write for themselves. Great. Then write for yourself. Don't okay. shove that crap to the rest of the world. Write for yourself. Enjoy your stories. You know, maybe make your spouse suffer through having to read it, even though they hate it, but they won't tell you that because they love you. But just write for yourself. If you are going to write for other people, then you have to swallow your pride and you have to realize you don't get to choose whether it's successful or not. That 100% comes from others. And the pushback that I always get from that, because I love steel manning my own arguments, is people will say, but you're wrong because I'm an artist and I'm, I'm right, you know, it's the art. The pushback is, yeah, except for the permanent reviews that you'll get on Amazon that are all one stars that say you suck, that are there for the rest of eternity that do not come down. So you can think you're awesome all you want, but once you gather a gaggle of one-star reviews on Amazon, your career's over, at least for that name and that book and, and all of that. So again, you don't get to decide <laughs> because at the end of the day, somebody else is. Yep. I completely agree with that. And now, for something completely different. How do you write the ending sentence? <laughs> so for me, it's really easy. I just write T-H-E-E-N-D. That's my last sentence. Now, I don't, like, I know that's on our list. Our producer, Monique, who is awesome, gives us a list of questions. I don't, I mean, how do you write the last? I don't know if there's an answer to that. So I look at it in the same way as I look at the opening sentence of my book. So the opening sentence of my book, the first thing the reader reads, I want it to be something that A, hooks them, but B, also like, like especially with Sangwill, with the, with the actual epic fantasy, the flavor text that I start with, I started with a sentence that that's like... Um, basically says no one knows what's behind the wheel right there's, there's, there's this whole philosophical concept but no one knows what's behind the wheel so when i write the last sentence i wanted to call back to that and kind of like close that loop around um if i can i i don't know that that is always possible in every single you know right book or whatever but I, I like to think of it as closing the question that you asked with the opening sentence. Um, and, I, you know, what? since you said that, it's, this is probably, it's probably going to be different for every story, every writer, every everything. Because yeah. um, for me, I don't really care about how the story started. But I do want, because all of my stories, this dark of a writer as I am, all of my stories are feel-good stories. I don't write tragedies, even though I'm a tragic, dark, and fancy writer. A lot of tragedy happens during the story, mm. but I don't write tragedies. I've never written a tragedy. I don't want, even, even this story that I'm writing for Harn World, which is literally a city where everyone dies. <laughs> like, everyone dies in this story that I'm writing. I still feel that it's a feel-good story at the end. Um, and so that's what I try to do the, the last, I don't know if I do it in the last sentence, but definitely the last paragraph should give the reader a feel good feeling. 
It should make them want to walk away. Because again, you know, in my Bard's Oath, I say I I'm trying to make people want to be better human beings. So my closing of all my stories are that last moment to make you emotionally want to take the lessons you learned from the story and apply them to your life. Yeah. So exactly. last sentence, I don't know. I don't really, because yeah. I also, you last know. Sentence, last sentence is probably a bit too exaggerated, but the last paragraph, the last, like I want you to close. Last with half that. a page, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my last moment is in every story is that moment where I, I'm trying to make sure that you walk out with a goody feeling that makes you want to apply the lessons that you learned in your own actual life. Um, exactly. Now, this is the beginning, but it's also why I've never gave a crap about the opening line of a, of a story. So everybody is, you know, that opening sentence has to be X, Y, Z. I've never, even when I was in the publishing industry, I've never cared about the opening sentence. I care about the opening half a page. Like, that's what I care about. Um, does that mean that maybe there are some agents that would have passed me over because I don't have this blow you away opening sentence? Maybe. Um, but I don't care because I'm not writing for an agent. I'm writing for a reader. And so I want to hook the reader in that opening moment of the story. And it's the same thing about the ending. So I'm not a sentence writer. I don't want a beautiful sentence as my opening sentence that blows you away. Not just, I'm not saying don't do that. Because again, the industry pushes that a lot. Your opening sentence is the most important. And I agree with that if you're trying to get an agent on the hook. Mm. But for me, it's that first paragraph or two. Do I hook you in the first paragraph or two? And it's the same thing at the end of the story. Do I make you want to be a better par person with the last paragraph or two? So that's why the, the question was last line of your story. Cause that's like, I don't care about the first line of my story. <laughs> why would I care about the last line of my story? Yeah. So we do have a so, question. Uh, the, pe the peanut gallery says, so does that mean that you are basically making sure the actual writing that it's clear to the reader that it's the end without writing the end? Yes, 100%. absolutely. I want the, uh, the, the end at the bottom is there just to like put a bow on it. I want the reader to feel like the story has concluded and they are happy. Yeah. You should not have to write the word the end if... <laughs> You, when you set up the plot, the external stakes of the plot, you showed the reader at the beginning what they were going to be. And then at the end, they could answer, yes, this was solved. No, it can't be solved because, you know, it was a tragedy. You've set up the internal stakes for the character at the beginning of the story. And at the end, you've got that binary choice. Yes, this happened. No, it, you know, it can't happen. And then the thematic elements. And again, thematic elements are more subtext, but you still set it up at the beginning and at the end, the audience should be able to say, and as long, like, that's what ends the story for the audience. Those binary choices, those three binary choices on those three levels, can they go answered, 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 check, 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 story's over. Story is over. Like, that's how they should I know. Where's the end should, is, is superfluous. I will say I do appreciate an author who takes a little bit after everything has been resolved, you know, if it's the end of a series, to actually give me that's, a happy, a right. happy moment, right? That's the return, or <laughs> yeah. you know, what we what we did the episode on the falling action. That's falling what action, did, yeah. Falling action, one hundred percent. We should absolutely give yeah. the reader time to kind of revel in what they just did. Yes, but they know the story is over because every yeah. single one of those three levels have been checked. Yes. We introduced it and we checked it off. Yeah. That's really it. And then it doesn't, the words, the end doesn't matter. Exactly. They're just kind of like the. It's the, like putting a period at the end of the sentence. Yep. That's all it is. It's done. I mean, even without a period at the end of a sentence, you know, the sentence is over. And I think that that is a good place to end this podcast. It's a good place to put our period. <laughs> Bye. Good day to our esteemed listeners. I'm Marie Mullaney, and it has been a pleasure guiding you through the nuances of writing and world building.
If our podcast has enriched your ethereal journey in any way, please consider liking and subscribing. Sharing our content with your peers is a powerful way to support our mission and ensure we continue to deliver insightful and valuable episodes. Your engagement is greatly appreciated. For a deeper understanding of the topics we've discussed, head over to Just In Time Worlds on YouTube. It is a treasure trove where fantasy meets history and science. Every Tuesday, you'll find new videos that delve into the intricacies of world building, drawing from our rich real world history. Whether you're a writer, a role player, or just a fantasy enthusiast, Just In Time Worlds offers unique insights that will enrich your perspective. Check it out and join the journey of crafting incredible worlds. If you are ready to take your writing to the next level and work with a group of highly motivated, dedicated writers who are all working to not only improve their writing, but improve your writing, plus you get to work with me on a weekly basis, then I'll encourage you to check out writersroom.us. This is a website that I have created that I really wish I had 30 years ago. It's everything a writer needs to become a better writer. Not only do we do weekly critique sessions, both from other members as well as me, we have daily writing sessions, I do monthly classes, Q and A's, we have activities, I do uh, all sorts of learning exercises such as I do a quarterly writing prompt contest and just tons and tons and tons of things. So if you're ready to get serious about your writing and you want to actually finish that novel and have a chance of it being published, then I encourage you to head on over to the writer's room and join me there. And as a special promotion for listeners of Releasing Your Inner Dragon, I'll go one step more. If you would like to get 50% off for three months, reach out to me. There's a million ways you can do that. You can do it through StarvingWriterStudio.com, DrakeU.com, any of my social medias such as LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, X, whatever. Reach out to me, say that you would like to check out the Writer's Room for 50% off, and I will send you a link that will allow you to do just that. So hopefully you're ready to start getting serious about writing, and I'll see you in the Writer's Room.